Let me start uh, with a short introduction. I will not bore you with a presentation. Ten years ago, more or less, uh, I moderated a discussion on new technologies, and I, sh and I ended with a short anecdote. Uh, I was talking about uh, the production plans of the future. So I asked uh, uh, what uh, would uh, a plant of the future look like, uh, and uh, and I said that uh, one one man would be uh, employed and one dog. The man would feed the dog, and the dog will make sure that the human doesn't ma mess anything up. So there are already some uh, factories that are fully automatized. And there are production plants uh, that uh, using 5G will be capable of uh, uh, producing a new product uh, every week. This uh, a technological revolution that uh, took place over the last 10 years uh, it's just unbelievable. Um, I'm not sure whether you were able to attend the last panel that I moderated uh, in uh, in the other room, but uh, we quoted interesting uh, data. So, for example, uh, there are 3.5 billion devices, uh, smartphones, uh, that uh, the astronauts from the Apollo mission couldn't even imagine, you know, given their computing power. So there are more mobile phone owners in the world than people who have access to main waters. In well-developed countries, uh, 75 to 80 percent of people have access to the internet and this is just a beginning the revolution that we uh, all see happening may not be fully visible in Warsaw but if you follow startups you will know that uh, um, automatic vehicles, uh, autonomous vehicles, uh, are something that could be introduced in a matter of years. So uh, those autonomous cars are not uh, that topical anymore. Now, uh, flying cars, flying autonomous cars, uh, are the thing of the future. Over 100 startups are working on the technology for flying autonomous vehicles. And I could go on and on enumerating those technologies. Those technologies are fueled by convergence, by synergy. We are able to combine uh, different technologies to create new products. This all makes the pace of changes faster and faster. I'm sure that uh, you have heard data on uh, um, on new inventions adoption. So you know that uh, the rate of adoption is uh, faster and faster. But of course, uh, every phenomenon has its uh, advantages and disadvantages. On the one hand, we can live longer. Um, we can use nano uh, technologies uh, to um, to live longer a longer, healthier life. We can solve some of the problems with um, transportation, but uh, there are drawbacks as well. Uh, 600 billion dollars, uh, according to McCarthy, 
That's the valuation of the loss to the world economy uh, due to cyber security breaches. And you need to remember that only 10 up to 15 percent of companies share data on cyber attacks. This is not the kind of data people would like to share. And of course, we have legal frameworks requiring companies uh, to disclose uh, that kind of uh, data, uh, but uh, those requirements uh, um, are not uh, obligatory for everybody. And then uh, we hear about uh, other kinds of uh, threats. Uh, for example, the one of uh, of uh, a president uh, of the United States, ex presidents had to uh, undergo a surgery where an when when where a a device uh, electronic device had to be removed from his uh, ventricle. So, when we think about threats, we think um, always about the ways to, to address them. There is research that shows that uh, high investment in cybersecurity uh, comes uh, uh, from criminal groups. Experts estimate that uh, those uh, organized criminal organizations, uh, because I don't mean petty hackers here, and these are not only Yakuza or other well-known criminal organizations. There are other groups. There are newcomers to the criminal world. So those uh, groups uh, invest uh, 10 times more in cybersecurity than others. And have you heard about the dark net? You can buy almost everything there, hacking tools, uh, for example. Or you can you can order a cyber attack as a service. All this is developing at unbelievable rate. And I believe that in this race, this dark side has the upper hand. And um, they are willing to invest in cyber security and cyber threat. So on the one hand, we have states, we have uh, intergovernmental organizations. On the other, uh, when we have a look at uh, the budgets, uh, they are not always impressive. But uh, I believe that um, our priorities are changing. What can help us to manage uh, network, the network economy when it comes to, to threats and risks. I guess that uh, standardization can help us a lot. You may remember that uh, standardization appeared um, in the 19th century as a result of the Industrial Revolution. Different spare parts had to be harmonized. The development of uh, standardization systems and entities uh, uh, was uh, very uh, active um, and well spread in the beginning of the 20th century. So, standardization is a way to address some of the challenges. And standardization enables uh, increased level of trust and better 
ways of risk management, both in companies and uh, on the state level. I would like to quote a um, fragment of a cybersecurity act that refers directly to this uh, area. It's a kind of a preamble. A certification of cybersecurity is important in increasing uh, confidence in ICT products and services and their security. The, single digital market, especially economy based on IoT, can develop only in an atmosphere of um, mutual trust uh, when everyone is uh, assured that appropriate security is in place. And certification is widely used in a number of sectors or will be in the nearest future. So this would be in the way of introduction. I would like our guests to help us understand where we are in terms of standardization processes, uh, preparedness processes, because I believe that this knowledge is not um, widespread among uh, companies and I think we need to emphasize this as it was said in the previous panel <laughs> let us begin with the um, institution that is uh, has the longest tradition in Poland, the Polish Standardization Committee in Poland. Um, could you please tell us a little bit about um, your committee and uh, its role, what it does? And I think uh, the role of that organization is not fully appreciated. And I'm sure that given the European regulation directions, the role of the Polish Standardization Committee will further increase. Well, you have, um, I think, in 2024, we are going to turn 100. So uh, the Polish Standardization Committee was established soon after the Bolshevik war and uh, of course was discontinued during the Second World War but it's still going on. Now after entering the European Union our role changed by 1993, standards were part of law. Right now the European Commission claims that it's also part of the law but uh, let's put that aside. The standards are um, um, Voluntary standards are voluntary, obviously, and uh, my organization is supposed to help all the interested parties, including the state administration, to develop standards. The standardization committee is open to any initiative from any uh, milieu, any mm, as any community, whether consumer organization, the industry, any other group, if there is an initiative, we can help. But we do not uh, undertake initiatives, so the Institute of uh, Communications has some idea for solutions. Uh, in the area of Industry 4.0, this initiative must be bottom-up. Now, you mentioned smartphones, so I'll I have several no, 3.5 billion, it's sometimes, sometimes more. Do you know what the two main reasons are to enable uh, the great, tremendous success of mobile technology? The, the, the first um, critical thing is miniaturization. So we were able to shrink a big um, 
let's say, box to the size small enough to fit into a woman's back. And then the other uh, factor of success was that all the interested parties developed appropriate standards. And so the same goes for Industry 4.0. If you don't uh, realize what needs to be standardized, if you don't develop standards, you will not succeed. Now, all uh, standardization bodies around the world uh, are developing some 4.0 standards, and we are dealing with this also. Now, you need to develop standards that will be machine readable, uh, read. Um, so the, those standards must be written in a special language that can be decoded. So the question is, which language? And perhaps we don't need uh, national languages. If a Polish machine can decode the standard in the same way as an English machine. So we also need to decide what uh, products to offer, whether we should offer let's say abstracts from standards that will enable the development of applications and what is the role of the national and international standardization uh, committees now you asked me about what we do I, I skipped that uh, eager to talk about these other issues but by 1993 when the PKN was a, an office and was part of the state administration, standards were obligatory. But then uh, an act of law was implemented that uh, adjusted the Polish standardization system to uh, the systems in other countries, in Western countries. And we signed an association agreement even though it's not fully accepted, everybody is uh, dreaming about returning to the obligatory system that was in place for 50 years. And uh, what is worrying, we can see those uh, trends in Western Europe as well. No. I think that you all realize the, the problems resulting from obligatory standards. It prevents uh, technical progress and hampers competition. And in a system where standards are obligatory, the mm, economy ceases to be free. It becomes regulated. So we are a body that does not develop standards, but we manage groups of uh, experts uh, the technical organs of our committee, and uh, it is them who develop standards. And I'd like to encourage everyone to participate because the success of Industry 4.0 depends on their work. Mm. I think that you have uh, touched on very interesting issues that that uh, are largely mm, ignored. Few people realize that in terms of how standards works and uh, in terms of the correlation between what standards are meant for and what they should be useful for. They should uh, serve the development of innovativeness rather than hindering it. And you observed a very interesting risk that, uh, again, few people have observed that um, there is a trend to get confined in a certain area, a limited area, as a result of emerging risks. So people say, OK, once uh, we have obligatory standardization, then we will know how it works, and we won't have a problem. Maybe we will not have one problem, but we will develop another Problem. This is a very interesting correlation, especially from the standpoint of the discussion at the EU level that uh, led to increased uh, ENISA competences. 
to address many issues related to uh, modern technologies, especially cybersecurity and the Cybersecurity Act, that is um, regulation that introduces a voluntary certification system in a quite uh, specific way, but it's uh, openly said that the next step, uh, the voluntary option may be replaced by a partial, at least partial obligation. So I would like us to talk about this example of uh, this uh, regulation of the digital sphere. I understand that the Polish uh, Standardization Committee deals with the entirety of the economy. Okay, okay we also talk about uh, what you said. We will go back to tattoos, even though it has little to do with cybersecurity. Now, could you please um, tell us about uh, the objectives of Cybersecurity Act and uh, and what uh, the consequences are for us, um, ladies and gentlemen? Thank you very much for inviting me here. Now, referring to the latest history. We should remember about 2016 when uh, a NICE uh, directive was adopted. And that uh, directive focuses on two important areas. One of them is risk management, and the other um, area is uh, reporting of incidents. Since it is a directive, member states are obligated. Uh, to uh, implement it, uh, even though it is not uh, directly applicable. Uh, we should mention that in 2018, the implementation of that uh, directive was done in Poland in the form of an act on the uh, national cybersecurity system. So it, it implements all those um, mm, uh, all of those points, but uh, it went a step further because uh, two years ago that mechanism uh, was uh, introduced in Poland, that is Article 33 says that uh, in s under certain uh, circumstances see cert um, uh, teams uh, can uh, test uh, devices for, for vulnerabilities, and if a vulnerability is revealed, they can contact the government's um, potentiary for security to issue a recommendation prohibiting the usage of a given product. Now, this is um, a first, um, the first step that is very telling. So, indeed, certification will be very work-consuming, time-consuming to certify a lot of devices and programs. Well, it will be very, very difficult now over the coming two or five years before we uh, develop a certification system. It is a method for eliminating the most uh, hazardous cases. Now let's move from 2018, when we adopted the Act on the National Cybersecurity System, to 2019, when the, uh, the European Commission published the Cybersecurity Act regulation, in which it introduces uh, certification in addition to the ANISA uh, mandate. It is indeed obligatory and cert certain standards or, uh, are not uh, explicitly mentioned. It's a certain framework. It can be clarified in uh, legal acts uh, of uh, lower order, but you uh, cited a uh, recital 
that uh, uh, emphasizes the importance of certification also uh, Mr. Tom Thomas of uh, the Polish Standardization Committee mentioned what the essence of standardization is this is a very good narration that shows this issue to everybody and also I think uh, encourages manufacturers of software and uh, and devices why it is uh, important to get certificates it's, it should not be perceived as a barriers to entry or something cumbersome but it should be uh, perceived as a possibility to build a competitive advantage and if you embrace it as such this could uh, indeed help the development of safe products so if you think about cybersecurity we need to remember about the many layers uh, network services devices, a variety of different types of devices, but we can also talk about different uh, sites of application of uh, devices and software and Cybersecurity Act uh, indicates three uh, safety levels, basic, substantial and high. Now these three levels are selected depending on what uh, environment the products or solutions are to be used. Now, the, this law uh, talks not only about the certification of uh, products but also processes and, and uh, services. So, if we try to estimate how much time it takes to certify a product or verify a product or a process or service, if we uh, take into account that software may have uh, different versions and uh, and uh, updates may introduce new functions it's difficult to um, uh, bring it into in control it's, this is still ahead of us but we must realize that uh, the strictest standards do not have to be used in all areas we should uh, take into uh, in consideration some lighter solutions, not only common criteria. And uh, at the end, I'd like to mention one more issue that is not found in the Cybersecurity Act itself, but we still remember about it together with the software of device standardization. We must also um, have some ideas about the safe uh, usage conditions because it may be the case that some devices, processes or services are safe but uh, in some circumstances you may use special use, apply special use conditions. So that would be it in terms of uh, recent history. Now you use this notion common criteria, and this reminds me that uh, uh, your institute, you had a big event uh, devoted to common criteria. That's what I read in the press. That uh, there were few details, but I picked up one thing, and that confused me a little bit. As far as I understand, this is the first laboratory in Poland that can certify products using the common criteria certification uh, pattern. Are you the first in Poland? Yes, yes. We will be able to. Now, I'm under the impression that we're discovering something that is critical uh, to Polish entrepreneurs and which is not really appreciated and perhaps not fully understood the fact that uh, we had the first laboratory in 2020 it's obviously congratulations it's fantastic because uh, uh, companies that want to get certification they need to go to Germany France or 
other exotic destinations, but um, we perhaps we do not have this this need this system. Uh, develop this layer of trust and also increase the value of the certified products, increase the competitiveness of products. I think that uh, entrepreneurs should be interested in that. As you look around the hall compared to other rooms, I think not so many people are interested. Thank you very much for all members of the public here, but I'd like to uh, discuss this subject that um, indeed entrepreneurs are not concerned about it they don't give much thought to the fact that their products may be certified well again congratulations on the opening of your laboratory but where are we as a sector in terms of the awareness of the new technological development and the importance of standardization for companies. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Now, in the standardization in this area, uh, we focused on standardization on terms of cybersecurity. It um, Obviously, it's uh, developed from the very beginning, but it uh, was not as important or perceived to be as important because the systems that we used obviously created some risks, but the systems were not uh, that complicated, but this gigantic uh, progress has magnified the problem. Many fold uh, systems are much more complicated. Um, now, the big data, it's uh, incredible amounts of data stored and processed. So, in our daily lives, we are increasingly dependent on the network, any uh, type of network, and the, all kinds of network. Now, uh, I have a, a daughter who gets very upset when the uh, Wi-Fi at our home is, is down. And this is only the internet. Of course, standards have uh, been developing, de being developed for years. We had a laboratory in Poland, the Agency for uh, Internal Security has certified, uh, I think ITSEC was the name of the standard, but the standards were de being developed in several areas. On the one hand, we had the United States and Canada was a major player. They had their own set of standards. At a certain point in time, the community of uh, cybersecurity experts decided that it would be good to combine those ten standards and perhaps integrate um, select the best um, issues from those three um, sets of solutions in that way common criteria were developed so a collection of uh, standards that is coordinated at the highest level as president schweitzer I think he's still a formal representative of Poland and in international um, standardization organizations. I saw, I see, also uh, introduced uh, those standards as official with their numbers uh, and uh, work groups. So those organizations uh, coordinate uh, cooperation at the highest national level. So the laboratory that uh, yeah, was run by the Agency of uh, Interior and Security ceased to operate, but there are some specialists in Poland. And for many companies and organizations, it was um, an obstacle because some systems that we use in our country, we have to certify. Uh, 
And the, for example, the electronic layer of documents like passports. And so, uh, the software for those um, chips must be certified according to certain norms, and we had to do that in international laboratories, which is not very comfortable. Why shouldn't we do it ourselves? So we had to reconstitute those competences at the Institute. This um, cybersecurity team has always been present and we often used that uh, team for developing uh, security and safety policies to make sure certain um, systems are uh, safe and uh, make sure that everything gets safer rather than harm, do harm. Now, this uh, system started to operate four years ago, and uh, we strove to create an expert group and obtain finances. Now, with the help of NCBR, uh, we were able to do that. And within the national certification uh, plan, we are in a consortium of uh, three institutes, the uh, MX Institute of Katowice, NASC, and the Institute of um, Communications now. Now we must have separate functions of the certification body overseeing the implementation of standards and uh, certifies products based on the results of tests and laboratories themselves that uh, also operate according to certain standards. So we adopted the national scheme uh, because we, we had to do it. And now it is implemented in the way that the certification body was adopted by NASC and the Institute of Communications and EMAC. Uh, we have laboratories. It's also a natural division of labor, let's say, because uh, testing according to the most to the strictest security standards is associated with a very uh, low level activity. You can attack devices at a physical level. You have seven assurance levels, the highest ones involve analytics of um, circuit boards, so these uh, processes are very advanced in engineering terms. You must have a group of engineers that uh, work with uh, device, have uh, an appropriate uh, apparatus, they can generate uh, certain uh, tools, analytical measurement tools. Now, for this to materialize, we must add that um, for uh, certificates issued by our laboratories, or issued by NASC based on our tests, for those certificates to um, be recognized, we need to obtain um, rec rec accreditation not only national but also international and European levels, so to get there, Poland became a member of two organizations, I will, uh, the European organization, the SOGIS, SOG-IS, -S, Information Security, and the other organization which coordinates a common criteria at the global level, it's the CCRA, and we uh, have successfully accomplished those processes. Those organizations are very elite. At the beginning of our work, only uh, several countries belong to one and the other organization. The most advanced countries, now the number of countries has increased, now our membership is not uh, completely full, but uh, we can already participate in the process. We opened the laboratory, it physically was established, and the most important thing is that the 
team has been training for the past uh, several months, perhaps more than a year, in different laboratories around the world, and to for the lab to be to get accreditation, we are planning to carry out tests of devices, software, software for those devices or systems. Now, if we uh, carry out those tests according to the standards, uh, being supervised by very strict uh, auditors, then we will get that authorization and we will be able to issue globally recognized uh, certificates. And I'd like to add something to what was said here. Indeed, those uh, schemes are the most uh, demanding or strictest, and uh, given the multitude of cheap devices that are going to be connected to all kinds of uh, networks, well, we need to uh, discuss this problem because we've been also talking about um, some light certificates. So if we develop very high laboratories with their high competences, they will be able to spread that knowledge at a slightly lower level. They will be able to, to train laboratories that will be able to do it faster and cheaper. Now, this is an ongoing process. At the beginning of our efforts, there were 34 laboratories around the world. I don't know exactly how many there are, but in Spain right now there are three. In Germany had nine. And please uh, refer this to the number 34 and which countries saw the value of uh, this. And, and we realize that in Spain we're going to have nine laboratories, and Spain right now is becoming the world's um, hub for certification in terms of cybersecurity. And like to um, say that uh, I will not mention the names of companies, but those uh, companies that have been um, really scrutinized in the telecom market. They started to implement those certifications in Spain only for the needs of the contracts implemented for uh, India. And uh, at that time, India imposed that obligation on uh, telecom provi uh, providers. Um, so. The issue is quite difficult, very important, but uh, I think we can do it if uh, we coordinate our efforts. It's very good that we um, took that first step. Now we need to organize well, as uh, it was said here, to take a, another step and develop this um, area in a, a regular way. Thank you very much for describing this process in such uh, depth, because we can see that this process is ongoing. It's a long process. It's still going to last another year, five years altogether. Second, um, other countries are really bet on these processes, and they perceive their competitive advantage here in Spain is a good uh, market. It's a benchmark market for many areas of the economy, especially uh, telecommunications, so we can see some uh, specific uh, dire directions for development. So I'd like to um, ask um, Mr. President here, you intrigued me mentioning uh, tattoos, but you actively participate in this international uh, movement, let's say it's... Uh, now, could you please come compare our position in Poland right now in terms of awareness and uh, preparedness. And why is it very important for me? Because uh, the round of questions will be devoted to how this process of certification, how to reconcile this with the high rate of diffusion of new technologies. This is a great phenomenon. We can see 
and and uh, analyze how this uh, process um, proceeds in the past the adoption of a new product may last may have lasted 50 years but perhaps even today we can read about a new technological solution that is a real breakthrough and uh, looking at this time consuming process how can you reconcile these two issues uh, the fast uh, developing technology which is also uh, very important for my domain which is legal regulations of course the law uh, does not uh, well follow development but how about uh, standardization can we indeed catch up to it yeah <laughs> my answer is both yes and no uh, talking about standards only uh, those uh, solutions that have been uh, checked, that have been uh, uh, proven in the market, can constitute a basis uh, for uh, standardization. Uh, coming back to certification, the European uh, Commission wants to introduce uh, obligatory uh, certification, and I believe that uh, there are two models. Uh, first of all, is the legally binding certification, where you are obliged to cert certify your products or, cert or services. But I believe that uh, voluntary standardization certification is better because businesses see the added value. But uh, I would say that uh, the clients. Uh, the purchasing party should require the, certi uh, the certificate, but uh, a certificate shouldn't be obligatory. It can only become obligatory when it's a part of a contract. Coming back to the issue of uh, keeping up with uh, new technological solutions by the lawmakers, I guess that we will never be able to catch up with technological progress. In the past, the majority of new solutions were developed at universities, then they were turned into standards, and then companies would apply for waivers as they were not able to implement those standards. But uh, then uh, um, in Poland we treat innovation and research and development as the same thing in Poland, but it's not the same thing. We should start with with innovations, then implement them, introduce them to the market and then create standards. That's the natural order, that's the right order. Let me finish. Um, maybe with uh, that I will wait for another question. I wanted to ask about your tattoo. I wanted to say that uh, we cover our economy with uh, many standards. Uh, the first standard was that of uh, uh, burial services. Uh, you know, I, the same goes uh, for translation services, the same goes uh, for uh, tattooing services. So, just imagine that we have over 300 committees that deal with all branches of the economy. And you, and you ask me about the world. Okay, so coming back to the global issues. We have over 3,000 experts, and our outcomes are up to those experts. But once again, I got lost. Coming back to the model of obligatory certification. I think that uh, the clients expect from the producers to know the standards. I don't have to think about it. Um, that's the attitude. My supplier should know about it. 
I don't agree with it. I think it should always be written explicitly in a contract. And when a standard is a part of a contract, then it's contractually binding. But it's not legally binding, as it's not a part of the law. Whereas in Poland, there is no culture of standardization. It's, it's always our mentality. We think that the state will get things done for us and instead of us. But the state cannot, uh, cannot fuel, cannot drive innovation. I do agree with you here. One of the most... Uh, one of the most uh, controversial elements connected with uh, the introduction of the um, ASC was the regulation uh, providing uh, for the requirements uh, for um, cyber security companies. Uh, there were all kinds of uh, requirements on um, physical security provision and so on. But let's come back. Uh, to um, our, let's say, narrowed down topic of cyber security. And uh, by the way, I'm afraid uh, we'll have to wrap up quite soon. But uh, before we do, I would like to try um, to specify, specify where on this uh, map of mitigation measures, uh, where on this map we should uh, locate uh, standardization. So uh, what's uh, the difference between where we would like to be and where we are? I've been uh, following uh, our implement implementation of uh, a KSC of 2018, I believe that not all of the decisions have been issued. So you could expect uh, uh, problems with this act. I'd say that, uh, you know. Uh, Implementation is not as easy and as quick as we would like to. Uh, standards appear in the KSC, but uh, you know we need uh, we need standards. We need standards in cybersecurity. I wanted to quote. Uh, a very interesting uh, sentence uh, uh, said by Mr. Mm, President uh, um, of uh, uh, of the National Institute of um, Telecommunications. Um, I'd say that uh, we we have very uh, simple. Uh, phrasing about uh, cybersecurity. But um, coming back, what is uh, the situation of uh, our standardization system right now? Where are we? We still have many standards to develop. And uh, where should we be? What can we do? What can be our next step to get to where we would like to be when it comes to standardization? I guess that Mr. Zurek will have a better answer uh, to this question. But I really liked your previous question. That was, uh, what can we do in a situation where a new technology can appear from one day to another. I believe that, that uh, voluntary certification is, uh, is the proper approach. But let us think, what 
motivates us to use safer solutions. This must uh, result from risk analysis. Uh, there will be spaces, uh, let's say, uh, physically small, but being very important when it comes to the, sensi the sensitivity of data stored there. So I would say that uh, in places where critical data is stored, then uh, using standards should be binding. No, it doesn't have to be um, binding as uh, coming from an act of law, but uh, in those most uh, uh, strategic, important places, uh, we need to use well-proven solutions. And uh, in our uh, national system of uh, cybersecurity, we have uh, some entities uh, named uh, that can ensure security. We, we can't have uh, too many of those entities as CS, CSRIT have to be able to cooperate with those entities. Uh, so um, I guess uh, that uh, when it comes to those key services operators, uh, the thresholds will become less strict and will have more and more of those uh, critical services operators. And I would say that first, first of all, we need to require certificates uh, for those uh, most uh, sensitive, most difficult areas and services. And yes, uh, where are we now when it comes to our standardization and where we should be? I would say that we are just at the beginning uh, of our journey. Uh, referring back to what uh, Julius said, and at the same time uh, commenting on your question. I guess that on the European level we'll have to cooperate, we'll have to uh, share tasks, uh, we have to take into account that uh, our uh, laboratories uh, specialize. So just task allocation first and foremost. Uh, second of all, the tools, we need adequate tools. Uh, some people have uh, uh, concerns uh, about software certification. Uh, but I, I, I agree that we we shouldn't certify those systems that do not process sensitive data. And uh, there are some tools in place. Uh, for example, you can uh, certify uh, the first version of, uh, of an operating system and then following iterations are not certified as a whole, but only the changes, the amendments introduced to, um, to software are checked and certified. Another thing is that I believe uh, experts should create standards and then clients uh, um, express the requirements. Uh, clients should uh, require certification at a given level, at a level that they need. But I'm almost uh, sure that the European Commission will introduce uh, some obligations uh, for those systems, for example, that are uh, run by the government. So for those most uh, sensitive systems. Now our task is to create a consolidated team of specialists. We have to come up with a system of light certification, but it will be 
an ongoing process and a never-ending story. So, I would say, first of all, we need to finish this uh, heavy, high system and create light systems, certification systems. Um, now, unfortunately, we have to end our debate. And I have this impression that we have uh, only scratched on the surface. Uh, if you know George Herbert Wells, uh, he once said famously that uh, Civilization is an ongoing race between education and catastrophe. And I would say that uh, more and more events point to the importance of education, as we don't know what we don't know. Knowledge on standardization on what can we take out of it is very important. Uh, we should uh, perceive standardization uh, from the point of view of increased uh, uh, comp uh, competitivity. And then standardization also facilitates uh, risk management. And I would like to thank the organizers that they found space on their agenda for this very difficult and specialized topic. I would also like to thank our listeners, and I hope that this debate was interesting for you. Thank you very much.